This is the first of two videos on the musculoskeletal system. In this video, we are covering the key concepts of the skeleton, joints and antagonistic muscles, which are key concepts of the musculoskeletal system. In the video, we will look at skeletons, how muscles work in antagonistic pairs and the structure of synovial joints. So let's start by looking at two types of skeleton, the exoskeleton and endoskeleton. Exoskeletons are found in arthropods, like insects and crustaceans, and they are external structures that provide support and protection. They are composed of chitin and calcium carbonate. Muscles attached to these exoskeletons contract, causing the limbs to move. Endoskeletons, on the other hand, are internal frameworks found in vertebrates, including humans. These frameworks consist of bones interspersed with cartilage and the muscles attached to them contract to produce movement. Now let's have a look at the muscles. When we move our arms and legs, we can move them towards and away from ourselves. However, muscles can only contract. This means they can only shorten and pull, but they cannot actively push or extend on their own. Therefore, to achieve movement, muscles have to work in antagonistic pairs. If you look at your arm, you have an upper biceps and a lower triceps. The muscles are attached to the bones via tendons, as you can see here. Don't mix them up with the ligaments, which hold the bones together. When the biceps contract, they put tension on the biceps tendon, and this pulls on the radius here, which results in flexing of the elbow. As the elbow flexes, the triceps relax and lengthen as they are being pulled by the movement of the lower arm. Conversely, when the triceps contract, they extend the elbow and the biceps relax and lengthen. The same antagonistic working of muscles happens in insects. When the flexor muscle contracts, it shortens and bends the insect's leg. And when the extensor muscle contracts, it opens the leg out, pushing the insect up or forward. The difference between the muscle attachment in these two types of skeleton is that the muscles are attached to the inside of the exoskeleton, whereas with the endoskeleton, the muscles are attached to the outside of the bone. With the antagonistic external and internal intercostal muscles, they have different orientations of the muscle layers. You can see in this diagram how they lie in different directions. So when the external intercostal muscles contract, they lift the rib cage up and out for inhalation. This lifting of the ribs stretches the internal intercostal muscles, storing potential energy in an immense protein called titin found in muscle cells, which acts like a spring. Then, when the internal intercostal muscles contract, they pull the rib cage down and in for exhalation. Again, this movement stretches the external intercostal muscles, storing potential energy. Now that we've looked at how muscles move bones, let's shift our focus to the joints that connect bones and act as pivots, allowing movement. Specifically, we will explore synovial joints. These joints provide a wide range of movement and are crucial for our mobility. Synovial joints are formed when two bones come together and the space between them is filled with synovial fluid within the joint capsule. The synovial fluid lubricates the joint and reduces friction between the bones. Cartilage covers the ends of the bone to provide cushioning and it also helps distribute the force evenly across the bone. There are different types of synovial joints, each allowing specific movements. The elbow that we have seen here, with the biceps and triceps, moves primarily in one plane and is known as a hinge joint, like the knee. This diagram shows the attachment of the muscles to the bones via strong, largely inelastic tendons that enables the muscles to pull against the bones. If they were too elastic, they would not be able to exert such force as they would stretch as the muscles contract. Flexion, or bending, of the elbow is brought about when the biceps contract and the triceps relaxes. The triceps contracting and the biceps relaxing brings about extension, straightening of the elbow. The hip and shoulder are ball and socket joints. Here you can see the hip joint. This is an x-ray of a hip joint with the femur here and the pelvis at the top. This is a diagram of the hip 
to illustrate the different parts of the joint. You can see the femur here. This is the largest bone in the human body. The head of the femur is rounded like a ball and it fits into the socket of the pelvis, hence the name ball and socket joint. You can see that cartilage covers both the head of the femur and the lining of the socket of the pelvis. The entire joint is sealed by a joint capsule and inside that is the lubricating synovial fluid. Tough elastic ligaments attach bone to bone, providing stability and preventing excessive movement. Muscles, which are not shown in this diagram, attach to the bones by tendons and bring about the movement of the hip. Ball and socket joints have a much greater range of movements than hinge joints. Looking at the musculoskeletal system as a whole then, the skeletal system provides a rigid framework with bones that act as levers and joints which serve as the pivot points. The muscles are the active components which, when stimulated by the nervous system, generate the force to move the bone to bring about movement. So in this video we have seen how exoskeletons and endoskeletons provide anchorage for muscles. That muscles work in antagonistic pairs to bring about movement by exerting force on the bones which act as levers. Synovial joints contain synovial fluid between the bones and allow movement in certain planes. Hinge joints, such as the elbow, work primarily in one plane. Ball and socket joints, such as the hip, allow movement in multiple planes. Muscles are attached to bones via tough, largely inelastic tendons, and bones are attached to bones via tough, elastic ligaments. You can see that the buzzwords are highlighted. Try and include these in your written answers.